Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our Mental Health Monday program uh, in cooperation with the Ringwood Public Library. Um, our instructor this evening is Susan Earle. Susan is a licensed clinical social worker who maintains a private uh, psychotherapy practice here in Ringwood. She specializes in treating children, adolescents, and adults. With over 25 years of clinical experience, she primarily utilizes cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT techniques, though she may also include other approaches while working with her clients. She, her work includes providing education, training, and teaching tools to her clients to help them better manage emotional and various life challenges. Um, Again, thank you very much for attending. And this is Mental Health Monday, sponsored by the Ringwood Public Library. And we are about to begin. So thank you for having me, Paula and Mary Ellen, the Ringwood Public Library. I'm happy to be here and uh, talking about mental well being, um, a, a subject that is very important to me and a subject that I've spent a lot of time working on throughout the years. So i um, delighted to be here and thanks for having me. I hope people find this helpful. And um, I wanted to talk about uh, mental well being and particularly anxiety and depression. And then a little bit later in the talk, we'll move into specifically anxiety and depression in children, but I thought it would be helpful to start with a brief history of mental illness and where we've been throughout the time in history with mental illness. So since the beginning of time, societies and cultures have really struggled with how to understand and treat mental illness. And Throughout history, there have been three etiologies or causes of mental illness that people have looked at to try to understand what's happening and how to determine treatment. So the three different etiologies are supernatural theory, the somatogenic theory, and the psychogenic theory. So as I said, the, the types of causes are going to determine what the care and treatment is. So we'll start with the supernatural theory. So people thought that uh, mental illness was linked to evil or wrongdoing and thought there was an association with the planetary gravitational pulls or that there were curses and um, it had to do with sin. Mentally Ill, Ill people were believed to be possessed or in need of religion as a treatment. So the treatments then were based on the concepts of God and the supernatural. And um, this included exorcism, temple attendance, and incantations to the gods. There was a return to the supernatural theory throughout history, and that was uh, during the 15th to 18th century. And as many people are familiar with, that was the height of the witch hunts in which about 100,000 witches were burned at the stake. And many of those people, unfortunately, were, were mentally ill. The somatogenic theories, um, th there was a belief that these disorders were biologically based and they had organic causes and that there was uh, this, the, the, the disorders were related to genetics or brain damage or an imbalance of bodily fluids. And it was in the fifth century BC that Hippocrates pioneered, um, he was a pioneer in treating mental illness. And this was the precursor to modern psychosocial treatment of psychological disorders. And the somatogenic theory remained recurrent, a recurrent theory up until the 19th century. So Hippocrates classified mental illness into four different categories. And the categories included epilepsy, mania, 
melancholy, and brain fever. So the belief was that mental illness was not shameful and that the mentally ill should not be held accountable for their behavior and that they should be taken care of at home. So the treatments at that time then included um, focusing on balancing the um, humors, which were the bodily fluids, which were uh, blood, yellow and black bile and phlegm. And there were medications that were administered and also the balancing of the bodily fluid that was done through bleeding, purging, there was rest and exercise, abstinence from sex and alcohol. And there was also a focus on changing the individual's env environment and their occupation. And we have the psychogenic theory of mental illness. And this focused on the causes having to do with traumatic or stressful experiences and um, maladaptive learned associations and cognitions and distorted perceptions. The, um, it was seen that the abnormalities were resulting from psychological problems. When we go up to the modern times, which was the 16th century to the present, that's when you begin to see asylums and there were then confinement laws that were put into place and this was done to protect the public. So uh, most of these people were institutionalized against their will and we're all familiar with these images of people living in filth and being chained to, to walls and um, some of these people were exhibited to the public for a fee. And um, these individuals were viewed as inhumane and incapable of reason and control. Uh, the 18th century uh, started with protests over inhumane conditions and that led to the growth of the humanitarian view. The humanitarian view was led by a woman by the name of Dorothea Dix. And she established over 30 state hospitals and at that time, patients began to be unshackled and they moved to well-lit, well-aired rooms with purposeful activity. And you, in the 19th century, you, there's a move towards more moral treatment. And um, that was, had to do with uh, Pasteur's breakthrough germ theory because of mental hygiene and the discovery of vaccines like syphilis and cholera or typhus. So the mental hygiene movement reverted then back to the somatogenic movement. Um, there were some influential psychiatrists of the late 18th and 19th century, and they went back and forth between the somatogenic and the psychogenic theories. And uh, we're all familiar with Freud who favored the psychogenic theory and that led to the cathartic method. And that was the precursor for psychoanalysis. Moving towards the present day, in the first half of the 20th century, psychoanalysis was the dominant psychogenic treatment. Um, that began the development of a multitude of schools of psychotherapy, which are currently used today, some of which include cognitive behavioral therapy and psycho psychodynamic approaches. In the mid 20th century, the leading somatogenic treatment for mental illness was and is psycho, psychotropic medications. So today we have um, both etiological theories coexist together, the psychogenic and the somatogenic, which leads to the, what we call the biopsychosocial. So this is, um, has to do with the treatment being combined, combination of the biological and the psychosocial aspects of the individual. So that, that's a brief history of where we've been and how we've gotten to where we are today. So we're really using the biopsychosocial, looking at both of those aspects of the individual to treat these disorders. And uh, you know, it's an inclusive, humane, obviously type of approach to treating uh, mental health disorders. So I'd like to move into talking about specifically anxiety disorders and then anxiety disorders in children. So anxiety disorders include several types of anxiety. Uh, when people say, you know, they have a lot of anxiety, 
Um, as a clinician, we really want to try to identify where the anxiety is and how it's manifesting itself. So there's several different types. I'll just go through them quickly. So we have panic, panic attacks, agoraphobia, generalized anxiety, selective mutism, separation anxiety, uh, specific phobia, social anxiety disorder, and social phobia. Anxiety disorders are the most prevalent psychiatric disorder. Most therapists and psychiatrists see many people who have anxiety disorders and it's, it's often you know, a huge portion of our practice. So in terms of um, statistics in children, we see that 7.1% of children ages three to seven years old, that's approximately 4.4 million children have a diagnosed anxiety disorder. For those children ages three to 17, more than one in three also have a behavioral problem. And then one in three have, a de have depression. So for children ages three to 17 years with behavior problems, one in three also have anxiety. So healthy anxiety, we, the term anxiety, um, you know, we have healthy anxiety and anxiety that, that is not healthy, but healthy anxiety is something, we all have anxiety and it's an emotion that functions for us and it, it communicates to us and it's purposeful and important for us all to have this because it alerts us to danger and it's an innate survival mechanism. It helps us to escape danger and it propels the body into this fight, flee or freeze response. And it, it you know, generally just overall, it protects us. So it is an important emotion for us to have. We don't wanna really say, uh, when we're treating anxiety, that we're going to get rid of anxiety because in some ways we, we and in some instances, we need anxiety, it keeps us safe. So, but as a clinician, we wanna look at what is an anxiety disorder. And if you think of the word disorder, it's when things are out of order. So when anxiety or an anxiety response is out of order, so when it becomes an irrational prediction of the danger of the physical, in a physical or an emotional way, when the, the, um, the irrational response is in, it's excessive and it's excessive in fear or stress response. And when the mind and body respond in an irrational kind of a way. So we have this irrational fight, flee or freeze response or a maladaptive avoidance or other behavioral response. So we're really talking about um, healthy anxiety as being adaptive and disordered anxiety as being maladaptive. Some of the causes of anxiety disorders would be genetics or inherited traits, life stressors, brain damage, environmental exposures before birth, trauma, or substance abuse. Anxiety in the body. So we do have this biological response when we encounter danger. The sympathetic nervous system is activated and you get this fight, flight, or freeze response to the threat that's present or to the threat that is perceived. Then there's a surge of hormones or chemicals that are released adrenaline and cortisol, and then the body prepares to enter the crisis. Then there's a blood flow that moves away from internal organs towards muscles, for, uh, towards the extremities, and the heart and respiratory rates increase, and breathing becomes shallow, and the senses become more sharp and focused. And of course, this is all to help us escape the danger. So often parents will question what, what they should be doing when they have a child that they suspect is um, 
having some difficulties with anxiety. And so, you know, a few of the things that I would recommend that people do, parents or guardians, is you want to really respect the child's feelings that they're relating to you. You don't want to dismiss them or, or um, ignore them in any way. You want to remember that the goal for your child is to begin to manage that anxiety, not necessarily eliminating it. You don't want to be um, avoiding things because this will help in the short term, but not in the long term. And it teaches unhealthy coping mechanisms. You want to communicate to your child some realistic, reasonable, possible outcomes regarding fears and what most likely will happen. And uh, you want to encourage toleration of the anxiety, even though this is something that feels um, uncomfortable, you do want to encourage that the child tolerate some of the discomfort. You don't want to reinforce the fears and you want to keep the anticipatory period short. You also want to help your child think things through and uh, play out the feared situation in the most likely outcome. I'm going to give you a little example of that. Um, I recently was speaking to a mother whose child was expressing some fear about going and cutting down a Christmas tree. Out of all things, you think that would be, you know, a fun thing that all children would love to do. And come to find out as the mother was exploring what the, um, you know, what was so uncomfortable about going to cut down the Christmas tree, the child was thinking that they were going to cut down a, a tree that you see on the street, this big large tree, and they were going to put it on top of the car and it was going to crush the car. So you never really know what children may be thinking. And so when I'm saying sort of play out the fear to explore what is going on in terms of the thinking and to so that you have an understanding of whether the child fear is rational and reasonable or whether they have this unreasonable, irrational thinking going on. So that's a way to kind of flush that out. Then as a parent or guardian, you want to model healthy ways of managing your own anxiety if you have anxiety and um, get treatment so that you can pass that along to your child as well. So some common symptoms that we see in children would be excessive fear and worried thoughts, feeling nervous, restless or tense, having a sense of impending danger, panic or doom. And, and at times children won't express physical symptoms, but if you explore with them, they will relate to you. So they may have an increased heart rate. They may be feeling like it's difficult for them to breathe. Sometimes they'll report that they're a little sweaty in their hands, uh, that they're trembling or they feel a little weak or dizzy or tired, difficulty concentrating or thinking about things other than uh, what the present worry is, difficulty sleeping. Sometimes parents see that very clearly, uh, experiencing some GI problems, stomach aches, headaches. Often kids will go to the nurse with a stomach ache difficulty controlling the worry and um, an urge to avoid things that trigger the anxiety. So some, of, some avoidance behavior. So some of the reasons why it's really important to seek treatment is because the effects of anxiety are really vast and um, they can affect people in physical ways Emotionally, they affect people's relationships with families and friends. They sometimes uh, affect people's occupations and of course, academically in school. So those are some, some pretty large effects that they can have. Treatments, as far as treatments go, anxiety, you know, I often tell people anxiety disorders are highly treatable. But unfortunately, only 36.9% only of people seek treatment, which is really unfortunate. And that the process of treatment is really um, getting a referral, 
going for a screening and evaluation and then setting up treatment. Some treatments include cognitive behavioral therapy, which teaches tools for the present symptoms of anxiety and also teaches people to use those tools ongoing in their life. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of therapy that is primarily helps people to understand that the way that they think about things is connected to the way that they feel and then what they do, so their behavior. So with people that struggle with anxiety and depression as well, uh, there's often what we call distortions in their thinking that they may or may not realize is going on for them. Um, and so as a therapist, we try to work with people to help them become more consciously aware of those distortions and then teach them tools to make corrections. With children, of course, it's different uh, working with children than it is with adults. And um, there are different techniques that I use uh, in my practice when I'm working with children uh, that are tailored to help children understand these con concepts and then put them into use to try to monitor their thinking and then challenge the thinking and change the thinking. Also, at times, there, it's appropriate <clears throat> excuse me, for medication evaluation and some of the medications that are used um, are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor inhibitors. These are the antidepressants. And also relaxation techniques are very important and they're used with both, both adults and children. Uh, and relaxation techniques are taught because relaxation really lowers the anxiety. You, you, it's hard to be anxious when you're relaxed and vice versa. It's hard to be relaxed when you're anxious. So we can bring down the anxiety when we increase the relaxation. So it's very important to uh, teach relaxation skills, which include progressive muscle relaxation and um, guided imagery, um, and also breathing techniques and meditation techniques. So those are all very important as well. There, there have been a lot of studies that show um, relaxation techniques, mindfulness and meditation has a very positive effect on reducing anxiety when it's done for about 15 minutes a day. Um, there's studies that show improvement in eight weeks. So. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice piece to include in the treatment plan because um, med relaxation and meditation is something you can do anywhere and um, if there are no side effects, uh, it doesn't cost anything and it works. So that's a, that's a nice thing to add. So uh, let, let's move on to depression and speaking about depression. Uh, and, and like with anxiety disorders, depression, there are several types of depressive disorders. The uh, disorder that we use when we're diagnosing children under the age of 12 is, we call it di disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And then we have major dep depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, which was formerly known as dysthymia substance medication induced depressive disorder, premenstrual uh, dysphoric disorder, depressive disorder due to another condition with depressive features, with major depressive like episode with mixed features. And then there's other specified depressive disorders and unspecified depressive disorders. So in speaking about depression and depression in children, what does it look like? So the thing with depression in children, it doesn't necessarily look like what you see with depression in adults, where people often think of depression as people staying in bed or people being very melancholy or not being able to work or um, you know function in any ways. So, so uh, with children, 
so oftentimes children will deny that they're feeling depressed because they don't really understand possibly what that means. And so um, children often may be seen as being irritable and parents at times may dismiss that as like a normal childhood mood, but we see a lot of irritability in children who are depressed. So um, parents uh, and guardians, it's important to not assume that uh, children can't be depressed. Sometimes children just lack the ability to communicate that. There was a study done in the Journal of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology that found different emotional reactions were seen in, in actually in preschool children who were depressed or at risk of, for internalizing symptoms and um, then children who were not. Emotional reactions like extreme shyness, unexplained physical complaints um, and boys three to five years old at risk showed more anger. Girls at risk showed more shyness overall. So some of the uh, symptoms in children that you see with depression, a couple of them I mentioned, but sad and empty irritable mood and the irritability may be seen in anger outbursts or inappropriate reactions or negative mood. You may see a big emotional reaction to something that's not a very large event. So there's this is um, imbalance in the reaction to what, what is appropriate for the reaction to be. Some defiance and declining grades or loss of interest or pleasure in activities that the children once did enjoy. You might see changes in appetite, weight loss or weight gain unrelated to dieting trouble sleeping or increase in sleeping, a loss of energy or increase in fatigue, changes in relationships with their friends, an increase in purposeless physical activity like hand wringing or pacing or slowed movements and speech. So these, these actions should be observable by other people. Also what you see in children sometimes is they may be very happy one minute and laughing and giggling and going out with their friends um, to a gathering or bowling or, or a movie or whatever. And then uh, they may seem perfectly fine and happy, but there may be some um, underlying depression there that those moods quickly um, may dissipate and then the child may become depressed. Um, you know, the, the point is, is that you can have a depressed child that you see go to a movie or to a bowling alley and have a good time with their friends. So you, you, you may see that. Uh, additionally, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, some cognitive changes in concentration and difficulty thinking or making decision. And then more seriously, some thoughts of death or suicide which you know, sometimes children may not express and that has to be uh, it, you know, talked about and uh, explored. Some somatic changes, physical complaints like headaches or stomach aches, uh, anhedonia, or, which is the inability to experience pleasure. And this, this can be actually seen and, uh, by children as early as the age of three where you can see that they have this inability to experience pleasure from age appropriate play. So in order to make the diagnosis, uh, we, we wanna look at these symptoms as being present for at least two weeks. Some of the statistics that we see with depression in children, 3.2% of children between the ages of three and 17 have been diagnosed with depression. It occurs in about one in 33 children, one in eight teens. Among children ages two to eight, boys are more likely than girls to have a mental behavioral or developmental disorder. And out of children living below 100% of the federal poverty level, more than one in five, that's 22% of those children have a mental, behavioral, or developmental disorder. Some of the causes of de depression would include a faulty mood regulation by the brain, biochemical functioning of the brain, genetic vulnerability, 
stressful life events, medications, hormonal imbalances, medical problems. Some of uh, those may mimic symptoms of depression uh, like heart disease, hypothyroidism, brain tumors, a vitamin D or B12 deficiency. We're talking about treatments. Um, treatments include cognitive behavioral therapy, which is considered to be the gold standard and it's evidence-based and a structured type of treatment. There is a, a progressive uh, form, sort of formula that we use where, when we're working with people that have depression and or anxiety and um, the skills build, build and, um, upon one another. And it's an educational process as well. But there are lots and lots of studies that support the use of CBT for treatments. There's also dialectical behavioral therapy, and this has become more popular uh, in the past, I'd say, you know, 15 years, but even more so in the past five and 10 years. This is a very structured form of therapy, and it's, it's used to tr treat really severe depression for individuals who are at risk of some serious behavior like suicidal behavior, or for people who are self-harming. And what they do is they learn to be very, very mindful of these symptoms and to be uh, conscious and mindful of the present moment with these intense emotions. And then they learn these problem solving skills to manage those severe emotions. There's also interpersonal psychotherapy, which addresses relationships to work on helping them become more healthy it teaches people skills for better communication and uh, feelings and expectations and to build problem solving methods for handling conflicts in relationships. There's also mindfulness-based cognitive therapy which combines CBT with mindfulness and which is what I was talking about a little bit before about mindfulness and meditation. It's a really nice combination with CBT, the mindfulness and meditation, um, both of those going hand in hand. So you're seeing more of that in people's practices today as well. Also, it's important, and I've always felt this as a clinician to engage families, particularly when I'm working with children that um, uh, I, I always feel like it's, it's helpful to keep that, uh, the, the parents or guardians very connected and to what the treatment is and, and what's happening so that they can generalize and, and help the children work on those skills along uh, during the week from week to week between sessions. So, and studies support that family uh, engagement equals a better response to treatment. And then also you wanna be mindful that the therapist and the psychiatrist that you choose specialize in treating children and adolescents, if that's what you know, you're know you looking for someone to treat your child. So living with anxiety and depression, and I say living with it because anxiety and depression is something that we're trying to manage and really bring to a level where we, people can have lives that are healthy and they can function the way that they should be functioning in an adaptive way rather than a maladaptive way. Uh, you know, we want to look at anxiety in people's lives as they're they're coping with it in these adaptive ways. At, at, like I said, as opposed to maladaptive. Maladaptive coping mechanisms would be things like self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. So managing the anxiety so it doesn't manage you also is, a, is an adaptive way of managing anxiety. We want to include plenty of self-care, which would be things like exercise, sleeping well, eating well, managing the thinking, the distortions in the thinking and the irrational thinking um, and, and challenging that, maintaining relationships, socializing, doing things like volunteering and seeking professional help when needed. 
So I, I do hope that this has been helpful in giving you a brief overview of depression and anxiety, a little bit of history for you to understand where we've been and where we've, we've come from and um, give you some guidance in regards to helping people make decisions and understand a little bit more about uh, whether to seek help or not. So thank you for coming. I appreciate uh, your interest. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take questions if you'd like. Hi, I have a question. Okay. Uh, what would an evaluation look like um, for a child under the age of five? Well, um, what an evaluation would look like is um, filling out some forms to get some history and background, and then meeting, mm -hmm. meeting with parents to also gain information in terms of uh, history, background, symptoms, manifestations of anxiety to try to understand what's happening in the in the present time what what the cause of the what prompted somebody's interest in seeking treatment and then really looking at uh, family history um, you know present coping mechanisms what's working what's not working what are the symptoms things like that so uh, it would be really information gathering and understanding what's happening in terms of the symptoms and uh, how they're manifesting. And then, and then talk, talking about a treatment plan. Right. So they're going to take a couple of months to really determine if there actually is something going on versus just being normal age appropriate behavior. Yeah. I, you know, it's uh, what I do in my practice is I send some forms out to the parents or guardians, have them sent back, then meet, uh, set up a meeting with both parents if possible or guardians and, um, and then have a, you know, a, an evaluation meeting and then set up another meeting with the child. And then taking all that information, putting it all together and then having a discussion with the parents regarding what my observations and recommendations would be. I see. Okay, do you have a website or should we just call you if we want to talk more? What do you what do you think? Yeah, I don't I don't have a website, but you can feel free to free to contact me. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. Any, anyone else have any questions? Comments? Um, Susan, I do. This is um Paula Tedesco. Um yeah. I, I was wondering, um, you know, during this time of pandemic, you know, many people are experiencing um, more than usual anxiety, um, not having, not being able to work, the kids not being able to go to school, them being on Zoom all day long. Um, what suggestions do you have for people to, um, to continue coping? Because obviously they've been doing this for a while, but you know, I know for myself, some days I'm absolutely fine and other days I just can't do it. You know, So uh, I was wondering what uh, suggestions you might have. Yeah, it's a poll. It's been really interesting to be a part of this at this time in our lives, right? This is something that, that none of us have experienced before, but yet we are all experiencing it. It's kind of amazing. You know, everyone in the world is experiencing this all together, right? And with children and, and adults, I, I'm seeing such a variety of responses to this, but I think what's important to remember with parents and guardians is to be mindful of the effects that this is having on some some of our children and that it's it's really it's real because this is stressful in so many ways it's a it's a life stressor so many things have changed for people and for children 
Um, and depending on where they are out at in their lives, you know, some are experiencing more changes than others. And also people are experiencing a lot of loss. So it may not be tangible loss, but you know, the loss of some um, activities, which are tangible, but um, I think that some of the losses are not really tangible feeling connected. That's not a, you know, a concrete tangible, oh, I'm not going to soccer practice, but that feeling of connectedness to a team and uh, being being united and you know these intangibles that are really not um, something that we can um, you know kind of really uh, put our hands on, but these things that are a little bit more obscure. So I've seen in my practice a, a lot of kids really struggling with being disconnected socially and. Uh, children that you may not think that that really has an effect on. So what I what my recommendations really are for parents and children is to be connected to something or things as a means to get through as a coping mechanism and to have some purpose which may not be what your normal purpose is, but to, and this is, I think has been a challenge for people um, today because you have to kind of reinvent yourself during this to find connection and purpose because your regular normal connection and purpose is really being infringed upon. And so there's an emptiness people are feeling and by, by nature, human beings really want to be connected. And so that, that's a big loss in our lives. So we have to be creative to find connectedness and purpose. Purpose and, you know, these things are two things that in good times keep us mentally healthy, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, when that's taken away from us, we need to find another way to bring that into our lives. Yeah, I think a lot of people are struggling with that. And, and kids, it's, it has been very, very, very difficult. Yeah. So I hope that, that answered some of your questions. Yes, I think that was very helpful. I think the, um, you're right about you know, connectedness and reconnecting. Um, I, um, as much as I am tired of Zoom, <laughs> It is really a way, um, you know, for people to get together when we can't see each other in person. Um, right, right. And, um, um, you know, especially around, you know, holiday time, you know, we can't do the things that we traditionally do. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's important to, um, you know, to try to figure out some alternatives and kind of like make lemon, make lemonade out of lemons kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Not easy, but. No, it's not easy, but you know, it's the best we have right now for now, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and um, we. I think it's also important to remember that this is not forever, mm -hmm. right? We, we have a ways to go and we're, we're getting through. It's very difficult and challenging, but this will not be forever, yeah. Okay, any, anyone else? Questions or concerns? Susan, what is your contact information? What is my contact information? Did you say? Yes, she Oh, okay. It's, um, you can call me at my office, which is 973-962-1111. Uh, now, I, I am currently not seeing people in my office and I'm using an app called GoToMeeting. So, I, you know, I have to just say it's, it has been very challenging, but I, again, I do think it's the best that we have and at least we have something. So it has been really particularly challenging with children because when I see children in my office, I have 
you know, toys and things for them to fiddle with. And I'm on the floor and I have a dry erase board that we're working on and, you know, different colored markers and I, they're drawing and walking around and that kind of thing. And it's, and I give them a Tootsie Roll lollipop and that kind of thing. But um, it's been very, very challenging to do this work online. So when I do meet with people in my office, I always, you know, particularly with younger children, always have a parent in the room so that I'm teaching the parent the skills as well. But um, online, I'm asking parents to really be present so that the child is not just in front of the computer screen with just me, I need to have parents there. So like I said, particularly with younger children, um, so that we can all work together on, on the things that need to be done. Another question, my son also has ADHD and attentive disorder. Um, how would you combine that, I guess, in the depression as aspect as well? Well, yeah, I, well, you're asking me, I think, how, how do you treat uh, someone who's got ADHD and depression? Is that right. correct? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, often you see with children who are diagnosed with attention deficit, they also have a comorbid condition of anxiety or depression. It's, it's common. So um, those, are, those are two different things that need different types of techniques to be used. Um, I, I, I would have to really evaluate your son and see oftentimes those uh, symptoms, they overlap. So sometimes you see inattention that's really due to an anxiety disorder. So, you know, in treating the anxiety disorder can improve attention and in treating perhaps the hyperactivity with relaxation techniques or organizational skills can improve the hyperactivity or the disorganization. So it's really kind of an individual thing that I would have to evaluate to see what, what the treatment would look like. I'm assuming that's something better done in person rather than go-to meetings. <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean, I'm doing everything online, Pamela. It's, um, it's I, 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 you know, I can't see people in my office right now, um, unfortunately. So I would do the same thing that I've been doing, which is sending out some forms to the parents or guardians and then having a meeting with you online and then, to, and then setting up a meeting with your son and you online as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I think maybe we're, we're good. Any other um, questions or comments for Susan? Okay, well, thank you very much, Susan, for your very informative uh, presentation and all of your suggestions and advice. Um, thank you to the Ringwood Library for hosting this series. And everyone, please stay well. Um, practice relaxation and mindfulness. Uh, we're all in this together. And um, enjoy the holidays to the best of your ability. And we'll see you next year.